Okay, so we were going to have some questions, a conversation or whatever. Alrighty, so um, my first question to you guys is, because um, I don't know exactly, well, I know we've talked about it a little bit in the past, um, but I'm wondering if you if this is what you do when you collect people's experiences from their beeps are you do you analyze that and determine things about their beeps like what specifically have you determined about my beeps more specifically or do you just not have that sort of i don't want to say judgment but analysis you don't give it an analysis you kind of just set that aside for whatever may come or do you have? So that's a great that's a great question, and if we if we knew the answer to that, we'd be in good we we'd be in good shape. But but I think the answer is basically mm -hmm. we set most of the theory aside, or maybe even all of the theory aside, in favor of trying to get the phenomena right. Okay. And why we do that is, I think, maybe somewhat up up in debate, but the up for debate. But but that we do, and I think is pretty pretty straightforward. Like we 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 try to do what. So you you illustrated it really well. You'd like to be able to go like that, and we would like to be able to get it. Mm -hmm. And and we don't. The technology doesn't exist, and I think probably never will exist. But it, but it doesn't exist this decade, and uh, and so we have to do what, what it is that that we do here, which is. Which is, I would say, sort of painstakingly careful. So this is our 11th sampling day, and we are, for example, mm -hmm. we're working at understanding what you have meant by sensing. And it's a term that you've used since the very first interview, and you've used it frequently. I, I went back and counted them, and I think before... Before the last time, I think you'd used sensing 71 times and mm -hmm. sense some quite a few more times other than that. And then in the last interview, you use sensing 30 or 40 times in that interview it, itself. So th this is not a minor thing from, from your perspective, what, 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 what trying to tell us about. Yeah. And, and yet it's taken us pretty long time to, to get to it. And I, and I think we are, we now have something of a sense where we understand it. We have a, we have a, a we have grokked, I guess you could say, what you mean by sensing to some degree. Whether we have done it entirely, completely, I think probably not entirely, but, but I think we have a, an idea about that. Do you think, or have you found in your other um, participants that they have had similar explanations? Maybe they use different words, but similar explanations towards whatever their sensing is when they have feelings or thoughts or cognitive whatever would you say that this is common or would you say that um it's more a little bit more unique or it's just or maybe people are doing it it's just in a different kind of way i i think that it's unusual yeah that you're so, so what we what what I think we've understood by your by your sensing is that a sort of a meta analytic view of not only am I doing something, but I am watching myself do it, or I am giving myself permission to do it, or I am recognizing that I'm doing it. So that that there's two strands of ongoing experiential things going on there, and. I would say that I think that that's fairly unusual. Yeah. And that, so how people, when you talk to other participants, like, because I want to, my next question was, what is the commonality between the beeps of every pe person you've experienced or talked to? Like, what is the thing that's common between me and maybe, I don't know how many other people you've done this with, but them? Is there a commonality, or is it just so widely different and subjective that you couldn't do that? That's a good question, too. I I don't know that we have 
that we have been particularly interested in commonalities. I would say we've probably been more interested in things that present themselves as differences. Yeah. Okay. I don't know for, for example, you have a lot of visual imagery. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think we've established that pretty... Pretty early, I guess, right? Pretty clearly. Yeah. And, and there are a lot of people who have no visual imagery. You can beep them until the cows come home and you'll never see a, a visual image. And then there are other people who have visual imagery, but not nearly as frequently as you do. And, and then there are people who have different characteristics of your of visual imagery. Your visual imagery is pretty detailed and mm -hmm. quick, quick to occur and whatever. And other people are going to have sort of hazy visual imagery or whatever. And, and I would say that our task is to, I guess, describe what the phenomena is like. And, and the alternative is to just assume that you know what the phenomenon is like. Well, you know, everybody's got visual imagery, you might think. Well, it, that doesn't turn out to be true. Well, it, it's it, and sort of in your case, I think you following Ryan or whatever back in, back in the day would sort of had a view of yourself as having inner monologue, which we have pretty much established that was not true. Yeah. And, and, uh, and yet there was little doubt about it, I would say, at the outset. You have, you have to go through this kind of a procedure in order to in order to understand what what experience is really really about. Mm -hmm. And so you asked about commonalities. One, I guess, I would say about a commonality is that very many people are, to some degree, mistaken about major characteristics of their own experience. That I think is pretty common. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Um, okay, so. In regards to that, then, um, would you say that consciousness is fundamental to existence? The term consciousness is a very right. difficult deal right. for me to get my head around. I have sampled with some people who have no inner experience of the kind that that you and I and you all and we are talking about. Yeah. That, who don't have visual imagery and don't have inner speech and don't have the sensing stuff, and yet they are they are quite successfully. I've sampled with some fairly high level managers of people, you know, who who when you beep them, they cannot say, "Well, I was saying to myself, or I was, mm -hmm. or, or I had visual imagery, or whatever." So would you say they have no consciousness? Well, that seems a little strong, mm -hmm. but they don't have any inner experience in the way that most people have inner experience. And I don't think it's an artifact of the method. It might be, it might be that the beep just scares their inner experience away and, and whatever. Um, yeah, I'm thinking of someone, because I do think that that is sort of a, a little bit of a fascinating thing that we find and I'm always a little more intrigued by the the stuff that's there than the stuff that's not there but I can think of someone who we sampled with um was an older woman and she was like even with us I mean very often clearly in an emotional state like really dysregulated or crying or um, and really described herself as kind of always feeling emotional and but I mean after a lot of sampling it just seemed pretty clear that she never actually had a feeling like she had basically no inner experience to speak of. So she could be in these emotional states or crying, screaming, whatever. And there wasn't the same, there wasn't a directly experienced feeling aspect of that emotion. So it's just kind of a fascinating case there. Yeah, that is interesting. So when you talk about people who may not have direct experiences of their inner experience, um, and so what, you, you can't necessarily say that they're lacking in consciousness because they do have awareness. You know, they do have some sense of awareness of maybe she's, she's aware of that she's crying or the person who doesn't have a whole lot of internal experience, he's aware of or she's aware of possibly what she's doing or he's doing and to become the successful type, you know, so... 
maybe, I mean, maybe this is just the theory part of it, but would you say that consciousness, um, I don't know how to ask it, um, that awareness and consciousness, like you could be aware and still, and call that consciousness, I guess, in some way. So I'm trying to think of the question, um, yeah. how to ask it the right way. Can you kind of see what I'm trying to say? Like maybe that there's not a lacking of consciousness, like in of itself, like lacking of the consciousness being there, but lacking of the awareness of the consciousness. Um, like, can, so I, I would say, I would say that that would be a way that you would phrase it because you are a meta analytic kind of person. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's also maybe the way that a lot of philosophers would phrase it, because I think maybe they are also, by nature, meta-analytic people. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that that's necessarily the way most people would do it. Yeah. And how and do you think most people would do it? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. And. I don't consider myself a consciousness scientist because I don't know how to answer this question. Mm. I think that the uh, I think that the answers depend on your definition very, very greatly. You define consciousness a little bit differently than you get one answer, and define it a little bit differently than you get another answer, and that. That's problematic from my point of view, mm -hmm. and 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 that's not the case in the in what we have been calling inner experience. Like your your inner experience of sensing, for example, is stubborn, in the sense that it doesn't matter whether we call it sensing or whether we call it meta awareness or whatever whatever we call it. You are trying to describe something which is directly before the footlights of your consciousness and the fact that it took us 10 days to get to, to get to an understanding of it may, it re reflects more its stubbornness than anything else you you didn't give up on telling us about about this stuff because it was in your face in your face yeah. kind of part of your consciousness or, or, or awareness even though we didn't under we didn't understand it you were still telling so there's so there's and and the same for your visual imagery. I think maybe the visual imagery is a little easier one to one to, to tell. The, your your helix was going this way. It was not going that way, and it was not going this other way. There were, it was it was this way, and it was blue, and it wasn't red. And you know there 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 are aspects of your inner experience that, despite the fact that it's private and that only you have the have have direct access to it, mm -hmm. there it is. It is the way it is. They're, they're... Mm -hmm. So would you say that um, from your research that um, I have a couple more questions, but this one is a new one just based on what I'm hearing um, that because I asked, do you think consciousness is a fundamental thing to existence? And would you say that consciousness is something that's occurring to us from within us? Or is it something that's occurring, whether we're aware of it or not, um, that is coming from outside in? That, that's the kind of, that is a, a good example of, the, of why I, I don't consider myself to know the answer to that question. Because I think that it depends on some adjective that you would apply in your definition of consciousness. And the answer to that question is either yes or it's no. Yeah. And it's, and it, and and then then we'll try to figure out well which just which adjective is it and then we'll get lost in that adjective and then it's another adjective which has to do with that adjective and it's, it seems to me that's a rabbit hole that you can't that I can't figure out how to how to get out of. Got it. Yeah, no, it's questions I ask myself too. So I I don't know that anyone really has the answer. But what you're doing is interesting because at least you're trying to be involved in the moment of what you call footlight of consciousness of at least that's occurring. Um, 
in terms of that though, because obviously there's really not a lot of ways you can do this experiment on animals like dogs or cats because they can't talk to you. But would you say that consciousness is because we have such complex brains and internal systems? Or do you think that it's, it doesn't matter how complex you are internally with, with your system or brain function that, you know, you could be as simple as a little lizard and still have, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It's not like you guys do your experiments on animals or reptiles or anything like that. But if you have a thought about it, I'd be interested to hear. So what I think is, <clears throat> is that there is no doubt, well, I shouldn't say there's no doubt, but my, my speculation is that there is a way that a paramecium is conscious. It isn't the way you are conscious, and it isn't the way I'm conscious, and I don't know what the hell I'm talking about when I say it would be conscious. Mm -hmm. But depending on how you define consciousness, I think you know, there's, there's no reason to stop it multi-celled animals you might as well have them be unicelled animals so really what i'm hearing which sounds kind of it's like in almost every one of your answers that it seems like consciousness is very much determined on your personal definition that's what i think yeah i don't know what, i don't know whether that's true or not okay <clears throat> my guess is that's true and it really it really it really comes down to my acceptance of my own ignorance and the, my acceptance of the of the limitations of my own intellect mm -hmm. that i'm pretty sure that i don't have the capacity to ana analyze that situation adequately to be able to give you a good answer and i'm i'm sort of happy with that or comfortable with that or or, or whatever do you think that the intellect is like a derivative of consciousness like or is the intellect just something that happens because we have very complex brains um because if a small creature could be conscious with very limited intellect but we have a very wide ranging possibility of intellect but we are both experiencing consciousness in some form of way whether it be and it's going to be widely different, but the way we intellectualize it's going to be different. So would you say that being intellectual has nothing to do with being conscious or having consciousness? I don't know. Or is that another hard question? Cause you know, I think you that's the kind of question you could use DES to answer that in some way. You know, you could sample with a bunch of really smart people or people all the way on the spectrum of intellect right. you know i guess you'd have to base it on intelligence tests and you could say well is you know your iq score associated with certain kinds of experience i don't know if that'd be a good idea <laughs> but those are, those are the kind of questions that i think that can be answered which is what is such a relief and such a good quality about des is they they are answerable questions. You know, it doesn't matter your definition so much because the definition of inner experience refers to something real, right? Like, you know, it's the same as if I said it's a rock. We don't have to quibble about what a rock is first. We can pretty much get on the same page about what a rock is. We can maybe make some distinctions, but then we can sort of get to work on like, okay, so tell me about the rock mm -hmm. because we can quickly understand what we're talking about. And I think direct before the footlights of consciousness experiences the same way we it is there it is it has qualities and i guess granted there are some people who don't have it in the way we're talking about so that puts a little snag but otherwise it's pretty stubbornly present hmm. Do you think so let's so so let's let's imagine that we could nail down the definition of consciousness mm -hmm to a place where we were all satisfied that this is what consciousness was. Let's imagine that that was possible. Okay. And then tomorrow when we wake up, maybe our definition of consciousness has shifted some because our neurons are not as quite as adept today as they were yesterday or whatever. 
or maybe they're more adept than they were yesterday. And our definition has changed. But we don't recognize that our definition has changed because our definition of change, the, the, the definition is sort of the perspective on which we look out on the world. Mm-hmm. And, and because the phenomena depends on the definition, then what we would think about as consciousness tomorrow might be different from what we think about it as, as today. And, and that's, <clears throat> that strikes me as being the fundamental issue. Yeah, and that's and that's because the because the the subject matter what what we're aiming at in terms of consciousness is not that stubborn. Yes. It's the evanescence of the evanescence, you know? and no. and so I so so I've given up on that. I've given up on trying to answer those questions mm-hmm. in favor of trying to answer questions which I think are interesting and and stubborn in the sense that doesn't really matter what words we use the words the words that we use can screw us up so that we can hide things from each other or whatever but the but we ought to we ought to try to we ought to try to understand what we can understand before we try to understand what we can't understand got it yes and i i like your example of how every day we have these small shifts, whether they're obvious or subtle, that would change. And I guess that changing probably has some effect on personal life experience. Um, But what I find really interesting about what you guys do is, and maybe this just because this is me specifically, because I am that meta person, but is the awareness of like what's occurring. And maybe that awareness isn't full of um specific things like words or even visualizations but it is but i am aware of my visualizations but i am aware of what i say i'm aware of this conversation i'm aware of you know my demeanor kind of you know all happening at once and it's not that i am i would okay how do i say this i would say that i'm aware of the fact that i'm aware and I guess that's my definition of consciousness and maybe there's levels to that. I don't know, but when you do the beep sessions with your participants, are you able to determine a person's level of awareness or does it not really seem to have such a parallel to, or does, do you not think that awareness has such a parallel to things like consciousness or is consciousness something that is aware or is aware. I don't know. I don't know what I'm asking anymore. I feel like I kind of went down a rabbit hole, but did I make well, I, think it, I think it makes sense. And, yeah. you know, Dr. Hilbert kind of said this before that your view of consciousness would be a meta one yeah. because now we know that that's how you experience the world. Yeah. And that was probably something sort of taken for granted, but it seemed like, of course, to you, like, of course, consciousness involves being aware of being aware. But from most of the folks we sample with, there isn't this sort of secondary or growing out of it awareness of what I'm doing. You know, they're they're just feeling and they're engaged in the feeling, but not aware of the fact that they're feeling or not aware of the feeling as somebody else's in the empathy type ways that you experience. So I, I don't know. But they are aware, not aware of the awareness, but they're aware that they're doing something or it's completely mechanical maybe for some people you know but would you say that to some degree just being so so the choice okay i'm sorry go on so the the word aware is just as problematic as the word consciousness so so the the difference is that you unlike most Mm -hmm. other people at the moment of the beep say in a way that we find believable not only was I uh, no, I, we don't really have any really good examples of where the where the sensing was at the forefront, and I can't rem- I can't remember 
Anybody got a good example from previous days yet last time maybe where sensing was a big deal? Well, the one you mentioned with your daughter, right? You were, um, you had this meta like I'm, or no, maybe the one with your son was kind of meta, like he's pulling at the drawer. I'm, I'm frustrated, but I'm going to be patient. Right. You were aware of that whole process. Mm -hmm. Do you remember okay, that? That's a, good, that's, yeah. that's a good example. So, so there's so there's there's two ways that one could. Obviously, there's more than two ways, but but we could separate these things into two ways. One is my kids pulling sharp things out of the drawer, and I'm going after them to stop them from doing that. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm aware of. I'm aware of that. I'm aware of the kids doing it. That's why I'm stopping them or whatever. So by that definition of aware, I am aware that that he's doing it. But what what I really, in my experience, as I would describe it, would be is I'm afraid for my son or something like that. And that's it. You are afraid for your son, but you also have an experiential locus, an experiential solar system, I guess I used that metaphor a little bit ago, that's, a, that it's own, that's its own thing that has its own experiential thing, which you call sensing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that is aimed at this, at, at the primary thing, which is, um, I'm trying not to show my anger at my, my son or something like that. Right, right. Do you guys okay. have... Okay, I'm sorry. Continue. So, every, so I agree that by one definition of awareness, everybody's got it. And by another definition of awareness, you're fairly unusual. And that, and, and that depends on the definition of awareness. Got it. Mm -hmm. I hear that. Would you guys say that in your personal lives, like how would you describe, I'd be interested to hear both of you guys, like, how would you describe your awareness in your everyday life? So I would, well, I would say for me, I don't think I have too much meta awareness most of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't but think I'm, I not, I'm not sure because I haven't worn a beeper and, and you know what I think about people's ability to know about their own experience unless you mm -hmm. examine it really carefully. I do actually know probably more about about Alex and her experience than Alex. Yeah. Ever could. And and I said I don't think so, but um, now that I am thinking about it, when we like went through and coded all my beeps, I had a meta category. We called it meta impact of self, where I was like aware of how my smile, what my smile is conveying to people, kind of a self monitory type meta thing. And I actually had a lot of that. It's a, it's a little bit different than it's pretty different than yours. I would say it's almost almost always about like what my face is conveying, and I'm aware of that. But it's still meta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're aware of your own body language. Yeah. So this this conversation illustrates why we don't do what the question that you asked you asked about. So we could say, well, Lena has a sort of a medica thing, and. Alec has sort of a meta thing, and that those are both true statements, but then it would have to be, well, is that the same meta thing? And the answer is, well, it depends on how you define meta. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, and the and the you know, depending on the on the on the difference. So your your meta, Lena's meta, mm -hmm. has to do with a, a sort of a, a uh, what I call a doing, but that's my technical term for it. It's a you are using your analysis of the of the situation to change the situation. I'm whereas Alex, as I recall it, and I'd have to go back and look. But Alex was just sort of noticing it. She wasn't really manipulating her face to look like that, or maybe she was. Maybe there, but most of the time it was there just, was like a continuum. Yeah. Hmm. So. Um, two more questions for you. Um, so in saying all that, um, can you or have you developed not necessarily a definition of consciousness, because clearly that's super subjective, but what have, have you been able to conclude or make a conclusion so far, or have you not done this enough times to draw conclusions or 
if you have any conclusions at all, do you, do you have any conclusions is basically <laughs> my question. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think we do have some con, some conclusions, and all of them are speculative because none of them are based on enough samples, and none of them are on randomized control mm -hmm. trials or, or or whatever. Yeah. But for example, in this in this situation here, the kind of doing kind of meta awareness that you have in my head, I associate that with anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that that's really true, and I and uh, and there's probably all kinds of what kind of anxiety you mean and, and and whatever, but but it seems to me, and when I reflect on what I've done over my lifetime, basically, when and that when I see meta awareness like that, I'm very often talking to somebody who says, "Well, I'm I'm anxious about something. That anxiety is an issue for me." Yeah, anxiety is an issue for me. <laughs> and, and you fit into that category, so you're one bit of evidence in favor of this theory of mine. Mm -hmm. And it's not a, a well-worked-out theory for me, but it's not nothing either. And and in if if there if there were a, what I would call a mature science of inner experience, then then we could work out the details of that. We could work out. Well, what kind of anxiety is associated with what kind of meta awareness, and how do you how do you tell for sure? And or or maybe Herbert's mistaken about that, and you know this was true for Lena, but it is but it is it isn't really true for for other people. Hmm. So, um, in talking to people like me who have a a more intense meta awareness, usually associates with higher levels of anxiety. Um, so my question is, do you have thoughts on why a meta-awareness would create anxiety in a person? Is it because it's just too much reflection, like you're just seeing yourself too much? And, or is it because, well, I don't really know, actually, I'm asking you. Well, I do have, I do have a theory about that. Am I hearing? And, and you all know what I think about theories, which is not much. But I, so I have a, a wild speculation about that. And, and that is something like, If that it takes time for you to have a meta a meta awareness, it takes time for you to have any kind of anybody. It takes time to have an awareness, and so if there's an event that goes on, and then you try to do something about the event, there's going to be a lag between when you want to do it, when, when you made the original observation on what you're going to do about that. There is a lag there, and and that lag, I think, leads to tremor. And the tremor is the center of anxiety. So, for example, if you're in your car with a fairly full cup of coffee and the coffee starts to slosh, you'll try to correct for that. And when you do that, you'll make things worse and you'll spill the coffee. For example, if you set that same cup of coffee down on the floor of the car, the dashboard of the car, it'd be fine. It would not, it would not spill on anything. What the spilling comes because you amplify out of sync, or in, actually in sync, but out of phase with the with the uh, world, and when and when you and when you do that, you end up being you ampl you amplify what is a sort of a natural frequency in the world, and that natural frequency, I think, comes out to be around seven or eight hertz, which is about the about the speed that people when they when they get nervous have tremors. So I think anxiety in in my world, whether it's right or not, I don't know. But the, anxiety comes from the failure to be able to manipulate the world as fast as you'd like to. Something like that. You're always a little. You're always a little late. Interesting. That's interesting. Um, so my last question in relation to all this is um because clearly what you just said could help people who do have extreme anxiety disorders or even maybe you have a theory on depression or schizophrenia or bipolar and what their inner experiences look like maybe you know this is a sort of, a sort of like breeding ground for a different type of therapy um do you think that possibly just knowing this can 
be coded into future technologies for AI? Because I know in earlier, earlier we were talking about, I can't remember exactly, but you said something that maybe in our decade we wouldn't be able, in this decade we wouldn't be able to accomplish being able to project out what I'm thinking necessarily. That just seems impossible right now. But in terms of collecting all this stuff, we could, do you think it's possible to code all the different variant, variants or variables of a person's inner dialogue into a system that can spit out an entire personality and give that more accurate portrayal of an inner dialogue of a person or inner experience? So that's a good question too. You got to look. You got good questions, but I don't know that there's answers to them. So, so I'm not convinced that the of the desirability of what you just specified. Okay. And the reason that I'm not convinced about it is because I think when you try to get into the carefulness of describing what your each one of those variables are, so. You, you were saying, well, you know, if you could have a hundred different variables that you could put into your 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 thing, well, you could be more efficient in an AI sense. So in a big data sense, I think you could you could definitely be more efficient. But in the in the actual Lena as an actual one one off red blooded person, whether that would be of value to you, that I think is questionable. Mm -hmm. So what I think what I think might be of value to Lena is what, basically what we've gone through. I think my guess is that the time that we've spent together has been some value to you, and it has impacted you in some way. And and it's probably not the case that you can specify what that is, what way that is, e even if you wanted to, because because your definitions evolve, and as your definitions evolve, then than what, what you would say about it. And the definitions evolving is a good deal. That's sci science is a pin things down into some category that we made up yesterday. And that's mm -hmm. not the way Lena as a real flesh, blood, flesh and blood person is. Lena is an evolving person who hopefully is a different person tomorrow than she is today. Mm -hmm. And because she's going to profit by the experience, mm -hmm. experience that, that she has. And, and so I think there's some there's some value as best I can figure it out to uh, to, to know thyself kind of a kind of a deal. Even though we might not be able to put that down into scientific categories. Okay, I do think I I see. I mean, I'm no technical person. I don't know how to code or anything like that. My husband's in the tech world, so he would know better. But it seems to me that this could be beneficial in future AI technology. For me, for example, I have a very specific meta way of being, and then, um, you know, Alec has a very specific meta way of being. Hers is different from mine, but it is in the meta category. Maybe there's multiple ways you can code a meta experience and input that into some crazy system. The next thing you know, you have a fully intelligent, conscious, machinery, you know, maybe definitely going to be different from our machinery. It's totally different, but our experiences of the world and our intellectualizing of the world is, might be, we can maybe replicate it. I don't know. It's just another mm -hmm. theory. But one thing I did say to you about this whole experiment that could benefit other people as well is, you know, as you said, my definition of things are going to change and evolve as I change and evolve. But one thing for sure that this can give everybody is learning how to separate the theory of reality from what reality really is. And I think that that's important because for me personally, it's allowed me to see kind of my own illusions, you know, and we all have them to some degree. So it would be interesting to see how people can utilize that and going forward in life and like how that can change their behavior, I guess. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think our theories about reality probably really get in our way and screw us up. And that it's good to see where they're inaccurate and face reality head on and let go of what our theories were telling us to do or whatever. Yeah. 
and and I would say it's not an easy thing to do. We we in the time that we've spent together spent the first five or six sampling days bashing away at. Well, come on, Lena, let's not talk about your theory. Come on, Lena, let's not talk about your theory. It took me a minute to get there. Yeah, and and you're and, not alone in that. That's that's a common thing. And that, and that I think, as you point out, I agree with you that that is of value. That, uh, mm -hmm. and, but but I'm not sure that I agree that people can watch this and say, okay, oh, well, I just won't do it, do my theories anymore. I, I think it I think it's a personal battle, and it maybe requires an, a a third party, a third a second person, to somebody who right. can. Who can who can point out? Well, you know that was a theory, Lena. Yeah. And uh, uh, because I think theories are really wily adversaries. And uh, I definitely couldn't do it without having some format with you guys. I think it's definitely something that a person would have to do with somebody trained doing what you do and being able to pick apart the questions, know exactly what the questions are, and try to decipher what that person's even meaning. Which is hard in of itself. So, I think it's. I think in that way, there's tons of value and and yeah. So, I'd be interested to see where this goes in the next decade. Me too. Yeah. And and we we appreciate greatly your willingness to have been a guinea pig for this because I do think there is some value and for other people in watching what you've gone gone through. I think. Mm -hmm. We're up to 140 some maybe subscribers to the Lena story, wow. and which I don't know whether you've looked, but on the I did last week, and I saw a couple comments. I saw one individual did it on themselves, but yeah. as we just discussed, you know, maybe he could or she, I don't know, could mm -hmm. be next guinea pig. <laughs> yeah, and. and so it's it's hard it's hard to know what whether that's a good thing or whether that's a bad thing. Seems like it ought to be a good thing. But. Well, I'm down for more. So um, I don't know how you guys want to go about future beeps and um, where you're at with everything. Well, I, I would say we're, we probably think that we're at a good place that we should stop for the moment here. Maybe sometime down the road we'll want to start up again. But, uh, okay. Which, you know, I, it, there's never a good time to stop. And there's, and, and certainly I've enjoyed every minute that we have spent together. We've spent quite a few minutes together. And, uh, yeah. Um, so I should I should send you a way to get the beeper back send, to send the beeper back to me. Oh, I can mail it. Yeah, I can put it in the mail if that's okay. That's that's okay. Probably ought to send it to my home address. Sure. Why, why don't I email you my home address and? Uh, sure. Yeah, email me your home address and I'll throw it in the mail um, sometime early next week. Okay. Yep. Well, this has been fun. Definitely have learned a lot, and um, you know, I know. Do you ever want to pick it up again? I'll be around, and I keep telling my brother he should reach out to you because he'd be interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting fella. Um, even my husband. I think my husband is what you described as the people that. Not that he's devoid of inner experience, just that he's you know, he's just he's different from me. You know. Mm -hmm. he, completely different to look at um i think he could be interesting too so yeah. yep whenever you guys are well, almost everybody is entirely interesting in their own in their own way we yeah. one, one of the things about this research you know which i've been doing now for 40 something years is it it's almost remarkable how interesting to me everything is as, mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. you know it's it is it for one thing it's a it's an entirely intellectual sensitive whatever it requires it requires all of my or our acumen whatever to try to figure out what's going on with Lena on her terms I mean that that is the ultimate crossword puzzle kind of a kind of a deal if you look at it as a puzzle so that in itself is 
is interesting exercise, like a crossword puzzle is interesting. And but then the the puzzle that emerges, the Lena that emerges from that, is an an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I have learned a lot about myself. Well, I've learned that I'm a visual person and extremely meta, and and I've learned that meta individuals, at least in my regard, have some underlying anxiety. And I think it would be interesting to explore what that means. And I don't know if you have a theory on that. I don't want to take up all your time today, but maybe that in the future, if I develop more questions in relation to what it means to have anxiety, maybe I can reach out to you. And if and I'd be, I'd be delighted to have that happen. And okay. uh, uh, okay. we can do that in whatever format and whatever, whenever you want to do like that. And so it could, very, it could very well be that the Lena converse, the public Lena conversation, which has been you know, the result of the YouTube channel or whatever, that may very well lead us to lead you to want to have a conversation with me or me to want to have a conversation with you or, or whatever down down the road, because that's mm -hmm. that's a phenomenon that's very difficult to predict and uh, mm -hmm. probably has nothing to do with you personally or me personally either. But, uh, but. Well, I know I'll have questions because I always do. So it's just a matter of when I get those out there. <laughs> well, I'm I'm happy to talk to you whenever whenever you're ready. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. I would be interested to learn more. All righty. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lena. Yeah, it's thank been a you pleasure. Guys. Yeah, I wish you guys the best of luck in everything. And like I said, if there's anything I can do to help in the future, I'm around. All right. And you know where to find us. Yes, ma'am. All right. Yeah. Have a your day. Bye. Bye.